Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen, Shane Dale, and a special guest, former Arizona football SID Blair Willis, who joins us often. He's going to stick with us for the whole show because there is a lot to talk about, guys. After what we saw on Saturday night, that triple overtime loss to USC. I don't even know where to start, but I guess, Shane, I, we'll start with you as we do now every week with Shane's standouts. Uh, give us a couple guys that are and gals, maybe, that you want to point out from doing a great job in uh, Arizona Athletics. Well, maybe we could uh, add that, maybe make this uh, Shane standouts and Blair's best if he wants to add a, a, uh, someone. Uh, but I'll you, you stand out. You got to mention the, the, the Pac-12 uh, freshman of the week, Noah Fafita. Um, who went toe to toe with the uh, reigning Heisman Trophy winner um, and, and did an amazing job? Uh, that one mistake that he made in the second quarter changed the complexion of the game and turned a game that could have easily been a um, not to say a blowout, but a win certainly a win for Arizona into a much more competitive one. But he was outstanding. Made some big throws late. That that, that throw he made on fourth on fourth down, the two point conversion. He played fantastically in overtime. I wish he had a chance to convert a two point conversion in the third overtime. But we'll get into that. But uh, certainly, uh, he was outstanding. And then on on the defensive side, uh, I I, I want to. It's probably the second straight week I've done this, which is kind of hokey. But the defense as a whole. Uh, limiting USC to 28 points uh, easily could have been 31, um, but uh, did a heck of a job. They forced some three and outs, especially early in the game. And I know Blair, you've talked about how Arizona getting off to slow starts. That wasn't a problem against USC. It was finishing against USC. That was the problem, Um, but that the defense had everything to do with that. So uh, those are mine. Uh, Blair, anyone else you want to mention from that game or from any other UVA sport? Yeah. Well, I think just sticking to the, to the USC game. I mean, it was a, uh, one of those classic college football games that, Mm -hmm. Um, is so exciting to watch as a college football fan. And, and usually from Tucson, uh, from Arizona's perspective, Tucson or Phoenix, I guess you should say, um, you know, oftentimes we're watching other teams play, whether that's, you know, teams in the pack or Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, wherever it might be. But to really be a part of one of those kind of showcase games, I think a lot of people around the country tuned in and were probably pulling for Arizona to kind of pull the upset against USC. So um, it was a big time college football game. I was really impressed. Uh, with the way Arizona played in the first quarter, came out, executed offensively, defensively, um, something we hadn't really seen them kind of put those, you know, consecutive possessions together where defense gets a stop, offense gets a score, defense gets a stop, offense gets a score. Um, and then you have to give USC credit. I mean, you know, Shane, you mentioned obviously the interception that, that um, you know, Noah Fafita threw. Uh, USC makes a play. Um, at home, they're going to fight back, get back in that game. And then I think you also then have to credit Arizona for fighting back, being down, you know, eight points in the fourth quarter, um, getting that thing to overtime. Uh, it just became a classic. And, and you know, it was a very deflating. I remember, you know, it, that game ends, USC stops us on the final two-point conversion try. And, you know, you just kind of, at least for me, I just kind of sat there for about 30 minutes and, and you're just kind of processing things. And, and the number one takeaway was was just, a incredibly proud of the effort Arizona had being in that position, having that opportunity. And then if it just wasn't any other player other than Caleb Williams, Arizona wins that game. I mean, he's really kind of the heart and soul of that team. I'm not sure exactly what their identity is on offense other than him. Defensively, they have some holes and that thing got to overtime and he just made some incredible plays and, and uh, a couple, you know, kind of a one-on-one situation, almost like basketball on that two point play. So yeah, just a, a great game, and unfortunately, we came out a couple points short. And I will right, just, just, just to follow up with that real quick, Eric, uh, it, this game reminded me a lot of the UCLA game last year, uh, other than the outcome, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Arizona gets up big early. UCLA storms back. I assumed in that game against UCLA, and I assumed in the USC game, once uh, both teams took the lead, it was over. And good effort. Good, you know, good try, but you're lo- you're going to lose on the road to a ranked team. And Arizona battled back both times, and, and that was – that to me was as big a statement as their start. You know, I know we're not big on, uh, you know, all, almost winning games. The fans are ready to start winning them. And I get that. Um, but I was proud of the the effort because I thought as soon as USC went up 28-20, I thought that I thought it was over. Well, it's time for Buy or Sell, which is presented by our friends at Ice Shaker. And there is so much to buy and sell tonight in this week's show. So we'll, we appreciate uh, them, Ice Shaker, as our main sponsor. Go to iceshaker.com, use promo code Wildcat Country, capital W, capital C, and get $5 off or go find them at fanatics.com. All right, number one, Shane, I will start with you. We discussed this last week, but as losses go, this was certainly a moral victory. Buy or sell? Well, I... Piggybacking off of what I what I just said, uh, I think you know I, I put out there that you know 
all I really wanted to see this year was the the prospect that the Arizona could be a very good football team soon because I didn't think they were going to win more than six games, mainly because I didn't think they were quite ready to make that leap and the rest of the Pac-12 collectively got better. And I didn't realize just how collectively better they were going to be. Uh, but the conference it's in itself and its final season has been outstanding. Uh, and Arizona has got a tough schedule. So I... No, I don't. I would sell that it's a moral victory. I think every single player and coach on the team would reject that, especially when 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 they got up uh, by as much as they did. And I know, like a lot of Wildcat fans, I've gone back and forth with on 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 Elon's platform uh, about you know I, I'm tired of the moral or the, let's say moral victories. I'm tired of almost winning. I'm ready to win. I'm sick of just saying wait until next year. But you have to consider where this program was at two years ago. Uh, if it was, you know, Mike Stoops' is, is team in 20, 2009, 2010, or Rich Rodriguez's team in 2014, 2015, I would agree. You know, you expect to win those games. But the fact that Arizona hung in against USC, hung in against Washington, they really haven't been blown out all year. They've lost two of their three games in overtime. They're, all I wanted to see was the the possibility that they were going to, they have a chance to be very good as soon as next year. And this game solidified that for me. So if you want to call that a moral victory, go ahead. I'm not a big believer in moral victories, and I don't think the team is either. All right, Blair, is do you believe in moral victories? And if so, was this one of them? No, I'm not. I'm kind of very similar to what I think Shane said. I mean, it's not a, a moral victory for me. Um, it's disappointing in the moment. Um, a number of opportunities in that game uh, to win it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, guys. Um, I, th- there were so many opportunities for Arizona to win that game, you know, maybe wins it going away. If you can say that, if you play a turnover free first half, you might yep. get into halftime with a 14 point lead, 17 point lead, who knows, 21 point lead, something like that. Um, and then you had chances at the end of regulation to win it. You had chances in overtime to win the game, uh, and they didn't do it. So from a moral victory standpoint, I don't buy that, but where I completely agree with Shane is, is you just have to look at the quality of football Arizona is playing, uh, really the way the roster has been constructed, uh, the way the coaches are getting the team to play, the improvement that they've made. Um, it's a good product. It's an improving product. It's And I don't know that it's a complete and finished product. I don't – this team through, you know, half the season, six games, hasn't put together a complete game yet. And it was, it was probably close against USC, but, um, you know, the offense did kind of go quiet for the better part of two quarters of that game, the second quarter – and much of the third quarter, um, the defense obviously had had some great moments, but then you know never was really able to kind of get that really game breaking, um, game turning turnover. You gotta when you're going to beat a top ten team, especially on the road, you're going to have to win the turnover battle. And uh, got a great turnover in the first half, but never kind of got that second uh, or obviously third one that could have really put the game away and turned it in favor of the Cats. But um, really encouraged by the product and, and, and the way the team played. But a moral victory, I don't really see it that way. I just see it as kind of that's the result. You accept it. You learn from it. Um, and you got a really tough game this week in Pullman. Yeah, you know, as far as moral victories go, like I look at the Washington game and I say, well, you know what? That was a Arizona team that was outclassed from the start. And they hung in there in the second half. They gave up 10 points and they were there. And OK, fine, you can give that a moral victory. But in this case, this was a game that Arizona probably should have won. Uh, and that's why I'm going to sell it and say that this is not a moral victory. Yeah, you played you played really well and you deserve to win the game. And we'll discuss other reasons why, you know, we're frustrated about the outcome. But I think at this point, you're you, I was more I mean, I was happy that Arizona stayed in the game, but I was more upset at the end of the game that we lost the way we did. And we're going to talk about that. You know, I, I would say let's go to let's go to number two here. Um Arizona's coaching was questionable at best on Saturday night. I'm going to, I'm going to use that as the overarching topic and I'll start with you, Blair. Would you consider what Jed fish did questionable or were you good with what Arizona's coaching looked like in general on Saturday night? Yeah, I think I'll sell it overall um, in terms of being questionable. I think um, the game plan was excellent coming in offensively, defensively. I thought the players executed it, you know, very well. Um, you know, there, there, there's always a few situational things that come up that that I think maybe you can question some of that game management stuff. And that probably comes down to the head coach at the end. Um, I didn't have a particular issue with not going for two in the first overtime. If it was me, I, I was kind of, yeah, let's take our shot. Let's win it here. But at the same time, kind of what I was alluding to in my previous answer, I did feel the defense was playing well. And I thought it was on the cusp of, of really 
getting one of those turnovers that that was just going to end the game or, you know, whether it actually ended the game and Arizona won because it had already taken the lead in overtime uh, or because it was going to give Arizona's offense the ball back with the chance to now win the game. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I kind of get the sense of, of just keep playing that game out honest and, and not just doing the coin flip, which uh, a two point play comes down to a coin flip. I mean, it's, you know, those are tough plays. Um, so many things can go wrong. So many things can go right um, on, on each side of the ball. And it's really a coin flip. So I, I think Arizona, and, and this is a testament to where the program is and what that game plan was going in and the way the team was executing was we felt like we could straight up, you know, win that game against that team. The problem was, and where, I, you know, I might concede the the notion of, yeah, probably, you know, maybe should have been a little bit more of a gambler at the end of the game and trying to win it is USC has the best player in the country. There's not a quarterback. There hasn't been a college football player at that position uh, in, in my life seeing it. Maybe Vince Young at Texas um, that is as physical and as dynamic and, and can make plays uh, the way Caleb Williams can. And to his credit, he made the, he made the plays. It, it was him one-on-one on the open field to the sideline somehow keeping his balance, keeping his strength, getting up all over the line for a two-point conversion, it was enough to beat Arizona. Dane, what did you think of the coaching on Saturday night? Would you kind of, you know, uh, you know, some people bagged on the broadcasters, we'll stay away from that. They bagged yeah. on the officials. We'll, I think we can all agree on that. But what about Jed Fish's job? What was your take on that? I'll start with the big picture. Big picture, I think Jed Fish called a good game. He, it was a great balance of, of of run and pass. I think he he stuck with what was working and, and simplified things a bit. I still think he, he cut out the flea flickers. You don't need to do that. Uh, it's just, and it's just not working. If it works, great, but it hasn't worked since Jed's been in Tucson. So I would cut that stuff out. But a couple things. Uh, as far as not going for two in the first overtime, it did remind me a lot of the 2009 game against Oregon. And it was kind of the same situation in that you know, USC, like Oregon in 2009 with Jeremiah Masoli and the Michael James and LeGarrette Blunt. At that point in the game, they were not being, they weren't going to be stopped. They were doing whatever they wanted uh, against Arizona. And and Caleb Williams and USC were approaching that point. And in that, that first overtime when Arizona scored, they could have, uh, Mike Stoops could have said, look, win or lose, we're not letting their offense back on the field. One play, three yards, win or lose right here. And Arizona and Jed Fish had a chance to make that that same decision uh, against USC in the first overtime. Jed did describe, uh, he said kind of what Blair alluded to, that, look, our defense was playing well. They were getting some stops, and we believe they could get another one. And he noted that they had already used their best two-point conversion play in the fourth quarter. So those elements went in. So I get that. I probably would have gone for two, but I understand his reasoning. A couple other uh, comments about specific plays. Uh, Arizona had the ball late in the fourth quarter. They were driving, they were running the ball. Great. Jed decides to throw a long pass, which I, I don't I don't know if he decides to throw a long pass after the play call from Jed fish. Uh, I don't necessarily blame him for making that decision, but it was an incomplete pass to, to McMillan. It ended up stalling the drive. Tyler loop has to try a long field goal and he misses it, which I don't blame him for. So, uh, that, that fourth quarter possession, I, I think that could have been uh, managed a little bit better. The only, and the, the, by far the biggest criticism for me is, you have to know the rules in overtime. There is no excuse for sending out your kicker when you have to go for two in the second overtime. It's one thing if you're like Donovan McNabb and you didn't know it was a rule and you're a player or whatever. You're a coach. You need to know the rules. And I'm glad they got it right. But they had to use a timeout and they weren't able to get that back. And it was just it was just a silly situation. So you have to know the overtime rules. So uh, I will mention that. But big picture, I thought Jed called a good game. There were with a few exceptions that I just mentioned. All right, uh, I agree with you both. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to sell this one that the coaching was questionable at best. With that said, you're right, Shane. Uh, how do you not know the rules uh, as a head coach in college football? Listen, I, I, we'll get to the overtime rules in a second. I, it, we'll, we'll get to that. I, I think I, I want to touch on his decision not to go for two in the first overtime. I found that ridiculous. I, I'm there are a couple games that stand out to me. Uh, I think it was Stoops not only against Oregon, as you mentioned, Shane, against ASU, ASU. in 2010. We know what yeah. happened. Yep. Uh, and Rich Rod, in a game Blair might remember more than I do, uh, the circumstances was against Washington, and it was um, Arizona. They were ranked, and we were not. And we were tied. The game went into overtime, and Washington won. But Arizona scored last and had a chance to go ahead. I, I, Blair, do you remember that game that I'm referring to? I, I, I do. Um, I mean, I do vaguely. I don't remember yeah. the – I don't remember who went first on offense or defense. So situationally, I'm not, I can't really comment. But, but my whole thing is when you're an underdog, the whole principle is when you are an underdog, you go for the win. Because, you know, I, I remember working with a guy that was an offensive lineman on the 1984 or that was with Nebraska in the 1983-84 Orange Bowl. 
uh, when they played Miami, they were down 31-30 and went for two for the win for the national championship. And I asked him years later, I said, you know, did anyone on the team get mad at Tom Osborne for doing that? And he said, not one. Everybody was all for it. If Arizona had lost that game in the first overtime going for the win, we are sitting here going, heck yeah, good for you, Jed Fish. You showed some cojones. We appreciate that. And now we're talking, we're going to end up talking about his play call in the third overtime. That is the issue that I have. When you are an underdog, you have nothing to lose. Go for the win. Didn't you learn from Jay Norvell the other week at Colorado? You're a, what, 20-point underdog, and you don't go for two, and you lo- end up losing? What, yeah, it, what it's are you doing? You know, it's one, interesting. Go ahead, Blair. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, this is kind of funny because you know, I, I, I worked as an SID. I was around Coach Stoops' staffs, uh, Coach Rodriguez's for whole, his full tenure. I was only with Coach Sumlin's, um, you know, staff for one year, and we can all – you know, make jokes about the Sumlin era and, and the way that turned out. There was one thing that Coach Sumlin actually sort of, I remember hearing from his first spring ball with Arizona, that was actually a profound statement. And it's not unique to him. I've heard it from other football coaches too, but he really did preach it from an awareness of teaching situations uh, to his team as early as spring ball. And that is more games are lost than one in college football, meaning a mistake is made by another team. A mistake is made by another coach. Um, obviously Miami was a perfect example last week oh, yeah. um, with sure. the way they missed Eric, Eric's parents went game. to Miami. Oh, you, you talk about a nightmare of a college football yeah. night. You know, yeah. I, I casually root them on at this point. I mean, that, that was bad. Go ahead. Yeah. So just to finish that up, you know, Eric, to your point of, of, of just sort of not necessarily defending coach fish or defending anybody in that situation as the underdog always going for the win. It's just that if you think your team's playing well and, and you kind of understand that, you know, football games often are lost by bad decisions or just, bad play more often than they're won by great play. Um, you know, maybe that tips the scales a little bit in your favor too of what your strategy is. But, you know, as Shane said too, you got to know the rules because that ultimately that could have, I don't think it did in this situation uniquely. That could though affect your strategy of how you're going into the overtime to decide whether to go to two or not, knowing exactly what, what is overtime one look yeah. like? What is overtime That's two? That's a good like? point. What we haven't talked about that. Yeah. Like? yeah. Yeah. Maybe he, think, he thought, well, we could always go for two at another time because – because he didn't realize that there wasn't the option to kick an extra point. That's a, that's a good point. I don't know if anyone asked him about that. Uh, let's talk about the college football overtime in general. Now, I, I think the new overtime personally is ridiculous, uh, you know, and, and they're trying to prevent seven overtime games or whatnot. But you know what? That's where a coach needs to show some, you know, fortitude and go for it. Go for the win there. Uh, Shane, do you like the overtime format as it is now? And did you like Jed's play call in the third overtime, regardless of whether it worked or not? Well, the third overtime, I mean, I know that the the, the sweep that that had worked a lot during, you know, in between the twenties, but at the goal line, it's a whole different thing. So that was, I mean, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but that was a that was a bad call. Yeah, I think you give Noah if he did a chance to to tie the game as as well as he had been playing. So uh, beyond beyond that, um, as far as the overtime rules, I, I would keep it. I don't like the two point conversion, the alternating two point conversions. Uh, I would. If nothing else, I would just say you have to go for two right off the bat in the first overtime. You know, th- th- that would open it up a lot more. Okay. I would, the way I would do it, I would overhaul a little bit more and just say every, each team in each overtime gets a first and goal from the 10 every time. Every first and goal from the 10, four plays to score a touchdown. You want to kick a field goal, you can kick a field goal. You have to go for two every time. That would eliminate a lot of these things and, and not leave it down to just dis- because when he is alternating two point conversion, it's almost like, like a penalty kick shootout in soccer where it's just more of a coin flip. So, no, I don't. I understand what, what the NCAA is trying to do, but I don't like it. Blair, how about you? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I, I used to love, you know, the previous college mm-hmm. football overtime rules. I, I thought it was beautiful. Uh, there's yep. been a couple, you know, games. I think the latest being LSU, Texas A&M, mm-hmm. you know, four or five, six years ago that, that went eight, nine overtime, something ridiculous like that, that kind of led to the rule change. Um, but no, the format now, I don't, I don't mind the, the going to two point conversions in the second overtime, uh, or having to go for two after a touchdown in the second overtime. But when you get to overtime three and just doing two point plays, I don't, I don't like that. It, I mean, it's just ridiculous to me. It's, it's still probably a little bit better than the NFL model. I don't like the NFL model where yeah. if you get the ball and you go down and score a touchdown, yeah. the game's over. Like I, I like the alternating possession. I think the one thing I might do that's a little bit different than Shane's idea about modifying it is. The, the first overtime possession, you actually start at the 40-yard line going in, so you're not necessarily in automatic field goal range. You, you kind of actually have to move the ball down and score because, um, you know, overtime usually seems to be 
field goal, field goal, touchdown, touchdown, and 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 things like that. I, mm-hmm. I kind of like moving the football a little bit for that first overtime as opposed to just being at the 25 and in. But if they would just go back to what it was three, four years ago, I I, I would be happy. Um, the, the whole two-point idea that they have now in the third overtime, it, it becomes – uh, it kind of becomes a little bit ridiculous. I watched Penn State, Illinois, the first year that they did yep. it. Those teams ran about six or seven plays each because neither one could get it in. And then when they did get it in, the other team, you know, got it in. They had to go do it again. So it just it, it kind of made a mockery of, of the game to me a little bit. Yeah, I'm I'm with you too. I I actually really like Shane's idea of what he suggested. Either go for two in the first overtime, um, you know, make that mandatory. Same with second overtime, and then you know from there. Uh, do go from the 10 yard line, you know, four plays from the 10 yard line. And, you know, if they're penalties, it's one thing that keeps the drive alive, but I, I think that would be great. Uh, but I think forcing teams to go for two is a much better way to do it uh, as compared to kick the extra point in the first. I, I think, I think it was garbage. And I think Judd's play call, you know, we can, we can argue this just because it didn't work, but I think I, I never am a fan personally of running a pitch to the short side of the field. doesn't matter you know, when it is, it, it just uh, running it to the short, you have all that field wide open, but especially in a tight area like that, that with the game on the line, I, you got to give Noah Fafita a run pass option there. As far as I'm concerned, I thought it was a, I, it's a, Hey, I, I'm out of plays. I can't come up with something. You know what, Jed, you're a football coach. I'm sure you have plenty of other end zone plays that involve passing pick one. I, I just, from the two and a half yard line, not a fan. I, and I know it didn't work in hindsight, blah, blah, blah. Nonetheless, uh, not a fan. Okay. Uh, let's move on from that. Uh, number three, let's talk about what everybody else is kind of, you know, going in on this week. Uh, Shane, buy or sell. Jed Fish is wrong. Noah Fafita should absolutely be Arizona's quarter, starting quarterback. I, regardless I would, of health. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I would buy certainly that it, that he should be. And, and I've been on that train for, for weeks now. I will say, I don't think it's as e- open and shut a case or as easy a decision for Jed as some fans might think it is. I think it, it's difficult. You've had a Jaden Delora who has been a, your starter for a year and a half. He's played some very good football, not recently so much, but he's played some very good games in an Arizona uniform. Uh, and you don't want to get caught up in the, what have you done for me lately situation? And you don't want to cut up and get caught up in, well, I don't want to uh, cost a guy's job because he got hurt. So I sympathize with the situation with that said, Noah Fafita has played better this season than Jaden Delora, and he should keep playing. It's as simple as that for me. If he if he comes out, if he starts against Washington State and Jaden Delora is available, which sounds like that's not going to be the, a scenario, but if it was, and he struggles early, then put Jaden in. But Noah Fafita, he looked good against Washington. He looked even better against USC. And there's no reason to think he won't continue to improve. I would like to see his, use his feet a little more like Jaden does. Um, but... I, I think that you roll with him. I think the offense is better. It click has been clicking a little bit more with him at quarterback. Uh, there've been fewer empty possessions and he's going to make some early, some freshman uh, red shirt, freshman mistakes, but Jaden Delores made plenty of mistakes himself. I think Noah's even a, at, at his younger age is a bit more disciplined on the field and makes better decisions than, than Jaden Delore does. So to me, he gives you your best chance to win. And I would roll with him regardless of, of the reasons behind it. All right, Blair, how about you? Uh, is Jed making the right call and saying that Jaden should be the quarter or will be the quarterback when he is healthy? Yeah, I think that last part of your statement it kind of drives my answer, which is yes, uh, because I don't think that necessarily Jaden's done anything to lose his job. Um, but but what I want to kind of frame my, my answer around is I have great confidence in both of them. When Jaden went down against Stanford, I was actually excited to see what Noah could do because I actually believe – no, could run the offense very similar to the way, um, you know, Jaden does and, and is able to execute Jed Fisher's offense. And uh, he did that. And then uh, he did it pretty well against Washington and, and certainly was very competitive and got better as that game went along, you know, fourth quarter interception, um, but did get better as that game went along and fought till the end. And then he came back with a, a really good game at, at USC. Um, I think for me, the difference kind of becomes in terms of, you know, how you frame your team and how you map out your season. Um, Jaden Delore is a captain of the team. Um, he led the, you know, last year, he, he really led the the turnaround of this program uh, offensively, uh, making this team go from something that, you know, we couldn't beat a full roster, you know, for two seasons, almost three seasons. Uh, you know, there was the COVID depleted roster with Cal. We were able to get a home victory in Jed's first year. But, um, you know, Jaden was really the piece that brought everything together last year, this year, 
rounded out the defense, rounded out the offense. Things were a little bit clunky early. Um, I think there's been some inconsistencies along our offensive line, particularly the right side of that offensive line that while I think we're doing some good things in the passing game and we're running the football better than we were last year, I think there's still been some inconsistencies. And I think that's manifested early in games um, up until the USC game where do we want to run? Do we want to throw? Do we want to take shots? You know, how do we really want to script that thing early? And I think there's been a little bit of feeling out with the offensive line, which in Noah's first start with, with Washington, first play of the game that we have on offense, we have a, a missed blocking assignment, right? At the point of attack, big tackle floss puts us behind the chains early. Um, of course, we sort that out. We have a pretty good game the rest of the way with the offensive line. Don't have nearly as many of those mistakes. But getting back to the quarterback situation, I, th- I see a couple differences at this point, knowing what I know of Noah, knowing what I know of Jaden. Shane mentioned it. Jaden's a little bit more of a threat to run the football and create plays with his legs. I would like to see Noah, whether he's the start, you know, the true starting quarterback for the rest of the season or just the starter in the next game because Jaden's not 100% healthy. I'd like to see Noah be able to use his legs a little bit more. Um you know, he, he's doing a good job avoiding the big loss on sacks, but getting out, taking five yard gains, 10 yard gains when they're there, trying to get a little bit of that RPO game back in there, which Jaden was actually doing a pretty good job of uh, in some games earlier this year. And then the second point would be sort of the reason why Arizona probably beat UCLA last year was Jaden's playmaking out of the pocket when things broke down. Um, he was able to make some some crazy throws on third and fourth down uh, to complete some passes last year against UCLA. And maybe there's a play in the middle of that game last week at USC where Noah got out of the pocket, moving to the sideline. He has Ted Aroa McMillan about 10, 15 yards downfield, and the ball just got away from Noah. It kind of threw like this duck hook behind him. Now we're third and long. We don't convert. We punt the football back, whatever we had to do. Um, I just think I think Jaden, much the way I'm not considering Jaden Delora Heisman Trophy candidate like Caleb Williams, but the ability to make plays when they're not there is something that I think Jaden has that is different and unique from the skill set that Noah has. Now, as a fan in our sanity, Noah might be a little bit more structured, might be a little calmer in the pocket, might make a little bit cleaner decisions overall, but that elite playmaking sometimes that you need to make a play out of nothing. Um, I think Jaden has that. He's shown it at Washington State. He's shown it at Arizona last year and at times this year as well. Um, So I understand where Coach Fish is coming from in terms of what might separate those two when all of the things considered, they both do a lot of really similar things very well inside this offense. My my take on it, and that's a very good explanation. My take on it is this, and I'm not a coach. I never will be a coach, but uh, just as a fan, I want the best players to play. I understand injuries happen, but if you get supplanted by injury, it happens. If somebody is better, if your backup is better, they deserve to play. I don't Tom care. Brady, Drew Bledsoe, you know. Exactly. Now, Lou Gehrig, you know, Wally Pip. Yeah. I, I mean, it happens. Sometimes you got to do it. I, I think what Noah Fafita did the other night, I don't see Jaden Delora doing that against USC. I don't know that. I think maybe the ceiling is a little bit higher with Delora as far as his playmaking, as Blair said, but uh, I think you got to stick with Jayden's Noah. Best games last year were against those same two teams that Noah just played. That's and true. I'm curious... That's- Long term, as as we start matchups, you know, we had very good offensive game against Washington last year, very good game against UC, uh, USC last year, did not have a good one against Washington State. So whoever the quarterback is this week, I'm very interested to see how this offense does against that defense. I, I want to touch on this real quickly, and then we'll, we'll you know, go to our last segment. Uh, just a two-segment show uh, this week, and we'll make our picks and talk about some other things in the last segment. But Elijah rushing the five-star commitment to Arizona is no longer. Uh, Oregon looks to be the uh, likely uh, pursuer there. Just uh, Shane, any thoughts on on that? I don't. I don't really want to do a buy or sell yeah. there, but just any thoughts on that? Well, and we talked about this before we started, Eric. I, I just we we celebrate it when when guys decommit from other schools and come to Arizona, like the two San, former San Diego State commits. So we love that, and then we we call people traitors when they they decommit from Arizona. I just I, the same thing as is always for me, Eric. Is like if, if you're going to go visit other schools, fine, don't make a commitment. Just wait. You don't have to do. It, it's just I, I just seems like such an arbitrary thing, you know. And and it it it's it actually is. It could be damaging to to the to the program that you decommit from, which I know is not his concern, um, but it, it's unfortunate, you know. And we talked a lot about how Arizona, you know, Jed Fish has done a great job with in-state recruiting, and he still has, but he's lost uh, two big ones in in the span of a week. 
Uh, it's come, both of them come right after losses, which is just coincidence, but still it's been kind of insult to injury. So uh, it's disappointing, but again, if, if you're going to you know, keep going out and, and if you're going to go out and date other people, then don't propose, you know, or don't, don't get engaged. Yeah. That's the way, that's the way I look at it. Blair, how about you? Yeah. Very similar to Shane. You know, I, the one thing for me recruiting, and it's been this way for me in any sport, I don't, you want momentum. You obviously want to sign good players, recruit good players, bring them to campus, all that. I never, mostly from a fan perspective, ever put a lot of stock in any player that signs in any sport until they're actually on the team and they're practicing. And now it's kind of equal competition to see actually how good are they. Um, I've seen I've seen four star players come in with a lot of acclaim that are no better than the two star um, that's been in the program for two or three years. Um, and that's not that, you know, it's not that stars don't mean anything. Stars really do. If you get a class of 24 or five stars, that you know, most of those sure. are going to pan out. But individually, they don't always out. pan out that way. So, you know, for me, I, you know, it, it, it hurts the momentum a little bit in recruiting, but I have a lot of faith uh, in what Coach Fish and, and their staff are doing. They have a great vision for the program. They've delivered uh, an incredible roster turnaround these last two seasons. Uh, I have full confidence, whether it's high school players, junior college, uh, or portal uh, this off season that, th- that the roster is going to be in even better shape next year. Well said, let me just uh, end this segment with this. Uh, I do not like the statement that Elijah rushing put out. Obviously I-, I would presume that he did not write that whoever did. I thought it was very disappointing. Uh, there obviously are reasons that his brother is currently on the team. Do you think he's going to play now it, more so because Elijah just decommitted and that statement came out? So that was, that was really, really disappointing that that was the statement that was released. With that said, anyone who tweets at a commit after they decommit is an absolute loser. You're an absolute, you're pathetic if you do that. If you bash a kid, and I'm not, I don't agree with the process. As as Blair said, you know, you got to wait till the guys get on campus. But if you do that, and you are the type of person that, that finds satisfaction in that, I hope you stop listening to this podcast, and I hope you get a life, because that's pathetic. It really is. And and some of the comments that that some of the retweets were absolutely disgusting. Some people should be really ashamed with themselves. So I'd end this segment on a on a negative note. Well, I'll true. just I'll just add this real quick uh, is I, I and I don't know how much NIL has, has to do with this, but I, certainly the, the the gap between the haves and the have nots have nots are it becomes even bigger with NIL. So, you know, a guy commits, say, to Arizona and then someone like, you know, like Oregon's got a big checkbook. I don't know if that was the case here. But if you could you wave more money than in a kid's face that he's ever seen in his life, it makes it tough to 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 sell. Even if you say, hey, great chance you can play the next level, you can get to the NFL, you'll have instant playing time, et cetera, if you come here. It's almost it's really hard to compete uh with six or even in the SEC seven figures potentially. Well, and there you have it. Uh coming up next, we're gonna talk about Gonzaga to the Big 12, maybe, and make our picks for week seven in college football here on Wildcat Country. What's up, everyone? It's Chris Gronkowski, and football season is back. Ice Shaker is a proud sponsor of the Wildcat Country Podcast. Don't forget to check out some of our new products, like the Ice Shaker with the built-in bump box speaker that's going to absolutely pop at your next tailgate party. Let's crush it this season. Bear down! Before we get to picks in our final segment, I want to ask you guys one more thing that's kind of a holdover from By Yourself. So there are rumors out there that Gonzaga is being courted by Brett Yormark to join the Big 12 for, for non-football uh, sports. Let's just say that, for the Olympic sports, whatnot. Um, is this a good idea? Shane, I'll start with you. Do you like it or pass? Oh, I love it. Uh, I, I know you're you're afraid of playing tough tough teams, Eric, so you probably don't. But I, I think it's I think it's great. But the Big 12 was already the toughest team in men's basketball, or the toughest conference, I should say, with Arizona uh, being added. Uh, and now it, it we're with Gonzaga joining, you know, imagine playing, you probably wouldn't play Kansas and Gonzaga twice a year, but, you know, at least, you know, two, three times and then possibly more in conference tournaments. So I, I'm always of the opinion that uh, the, the tougher the, your your conference road, the the better prepped you are for the NCAA tournament. So uh, I'm in favor of it. It's a shame that it, it didn't take the Big 12 long to try to add Gonzaga after the Pac-12, you know, that they had presumably had opportunities to do so and either passed or Gonzaga passed or both. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's a great idea and I'd love to see uh, as much as Tommy Lloyd and Mark Few probably don't like it. Uh, I'd love to see Arizona and Gonzaga clash at least once, if not two or three times a year. All right. Uh, Blair, how about you? 
yeah, I'm all I'm all in favor of it. I, as long as the financials work out okay, and certainly the existing Big 12 members and the ones like Arizona that are joining the league aren't going to be giving up any of their own revenue for it. As long as Brett Yarmark can make it work with the TV partners and and with Gonzaga and whatever concessions they might make to the revenue opportunities that would be basketball, primarily basketball driven. Um, competitively, I think it'll be awesome. I mean, Gonzaga is a great program. Um, you know, it, it, it'd be one more kind of, you know, West Coast basketball brand to have along with Arizona, um, you know, when you lose UCLA and USC to the Big Ten. So I think it'd be fun. Great games. I mean, imagine Gonzaga at Allen Fieldhouse, Gonzaga at McHale Center, um, obviously the move the triangle all around Baylor, Kansas state. I mean, TCU, I mean, it'll be a really, some really fun matchups. And, uh, certainly I think Brett Yarmark has a, has a good vision in terms of what could be, um, in terms of, obviously there's a lot of revenue in college football and, uh, the college football playoffs is going to continue to drive more revenue. And as long as the big 12 has a end with a college football playoff and it has good paths to that championship, uh, in the future, um, there may be an opportunity to break off your basketball contract, uh, away from what these, you know, all encompassing media deals have been for conferences. So I think it's creative thinking and competitively be a lot of fun for the fans and the schools. I am going to, I hate to disagree with both of you guys, but as far as I'm concerned, I, I just don't see how the financials work in the interim. Um, you know, these, these TV contracts are basically driven by football. Um, unless Gonzaga is willing to come for free, which if I were them, I'm not sure that it really benefits them. But uh, is it really worth it to give up any uh, of the income that Arizona is going to bring in from the TV contract? Absolutely not. So unless they are essentially free, I'd say pass and wait until closer to the next television negotiations. And plus, let's see what happens to Gonzaga once Mark Few has gone. I mean, he's been outstanding, but but what happens after that? Do they are they still relevant? Gonzaga is the one mid major that that has stayed relevant because Mark Few stayed there. It, almost every single time you see a, a great. Uh, or mid-major uh, make that big leap, their coach goes goes elsewhere you know, to a bigger NCAA, NCAA school or in uh, Brad Stevens' case uh, to the to the Boston Celtics. So it, Mark Few is is the exception, and he is the I agree with you. He's he is the reason that Gonzaga has been as good as they have for for, for so long. But I think the question is when he leaves is does the Gonzaga brand stick? because it's been at the top for as long as it has. And, and that's exactly it. If I know that Mark Few is 60, if I know he's going to be there for 10, 12 more years, yeah, then sure. You know what? It makes sense. As long as Arizona and the other schools don't lose revenue. Simple as that. You know, just going to go with that. All right. So I want to ask you guys, uh, let's get to our uh, college football picks. Only eight games on the slate this week. Shane and I both went five and five last week. Our guest picker, Matt Moreno, went four and six. How so, about that LSU backdoor cover? That was, uh, that that was something. something. That was something. I am 10 games over 500. Shane is two games over 500. He is four games behind me, if you are looking at it that way. And the guest pickers are under 500 at 28, 30, and 2. So Blair is on the hot seat this week, and we will let him start with our first game, which is Stanford at Colorado, who is an 11 and a half point favorite. Blair, can Deion Sanders' team on Friday night cover 11 and a half against Stanford? Yeah, certainly. I think being at home, Colorado is probably going to be uh, in a good position to win this game. Uh, but I am a little bit interested to see Stanford. I think they're coming off a bye week. Played Arizona pretty well you know, a few weeks back, then played Oregon good for a half. Maybe they can cobble something together offensively against what is still, uh, you know, it's not going to be an elite Colorado defense this year. And they're so thin. The Buffaloes are so thin in really all positions. You know, they could be a player or two away from from you know really turning into a pretty poor team again. But I would say the Buffaloes are going to win at home. I say they do not cover, though. I think it's about a 10 or 11-point game, so that 11-and-a-half, I will uh, take the points with Stanford. All right, I like it. Shane, how about you? Yeah, Colorado's definitely come down a, a bit to earth the last few weeks, including a, a game really for the second straight week. It's a game I thought the issue should have won. Um, and you know, beating the issue by three on the road is, is not anything to uh, to really brag about, but I know it won't stop Deion Sanders and Colorado from doing so. With that said, uh, Stanford, their defense is decent. I know they're, they're coming off a bye, but I, I think Colorado is probably a six or seven win team, but I think that's good enough to to cover against Stanford at home. So I'm going to take uh, take the buffs. Yeah, I mean, I love the angle of a team coming off the bye. Um, I just think if Travis Hunter is back as I think he might be this week for Colorado, I think they're two touchdowns better. So I'd give Colorado a, a slight advantage there, uh, above that 11 and a half. So I'm going to, I'm going to roll with Colorado as well, Shane. So we'll agree on that one. How about Utah, which is a 13 and a half point home favorite against Cal. I like them to cover Shane. I think they've, they have only in the last 
uh, two and a half seasons, they have only not beaten two teams at home. They're undefeated at home, but only two of them have been by single digits. USC last year and UCLA in their last game. Maybe we see Cam rising this week, but do we see Utah cover 13 and a half, Shane? Yeah, I think I've learned my lesson and you you take Utah with the points at home. Uh, Now, Utah's kind of this, it's situation where they're going to be able to score enough points to put enough distance between themselves and Cal. But I think they probably, if it were in, if that game were in Berkeley, I think it, it would almost be a toss up really. But in, in Salt Lake, I'm going to take Utah to win and I'm going to take them to win by at least two touchdowns. All right, Blair, how about you? Yeah. Another team coming off the bye uh, in Utah. So I think they're a little bit healthier, um, you know, even on the defensive side of the ball where they've taken some injuries this year, being at home. Uh, Cal is just, I like Justin Wilcox as a coach and, and, and he's, he's got a, you know, a team that's a good underdog. Typically he keeps games closer than they're supposed to be, even when they're, you know, overwhelming underdogs, but they just, their quarterback positions all over the place. I can't trust them. I'll take Kyle Whittingham's defense, you know, every day of the week over, over Cal. So um, even the 13 and a half, I, I, I think Utah finds a way to run away with this one at home. Yeah. I like Utah three touchdowns. Uh, I, I don't think this one's close at all. All right. How about Texas A&M at Tennessee? I'll start with you, Blair. Tennessee is only a three and a half point favorite, which kind of surprises me considering A&M season pretty much ended last week when they lost to Alabama. Yeah, I'm going to actually take Texas A&M to win this one mm. straight up here. Wow. Um, I like their defense. I'm not real sold on, on uh, you know, Tennessee at the quarterback position this year like they were last year. Um, I think I, I think Texas a and is a better team than um, – They've kind of shown they had a tough loss to Miami earlier in the year. Obviously, Alabama got them last week. I think they bounced back. Tennessee's, <clears throat> excuse me, Tennessee's really struggled historically against the SEC West. And I think this is a good enough defense from Texas A&M to uh, go on the road and win. All right, Shane, how about you? Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like both these teams I'm not as impressed by as I as maybe I expected to be uh, going into the beginning of the season. Um, A&M, I, th- I think... Bama's getting themselves right. And so I think the Alabama deserves a lot of credit for, for winning at AM. Uh with that said, it two teams that I, I'm a little underwhelmed by when in doubt go with the home team. So I'm going to take Tennessee. Yeah, I like Tennessee as well here. I I, I was big on AM to go uh at the start of the year, but uh not as impressed. Uh they, that was a game they should have won last week. They did not. And I think Tennessee wins this game by about a touchdown. All right. Speaking of a team, I mean, you know, Miami, I, we referenced it earlier in the show. I don't even know what to say about what Mario Cristobal did. If you didn't, if you don't know, just search it on uh, X and you'll see what the deal is. It was dreadful. But UNC, North Carolina is a three and a half point home favorite against Miami. I like the Tar Heels to win this game by a touchdown. I just don't see how Miami bounces back off of that. Plus, UNC has won four in a row, Shane, who you got in the series and overall, by the way, five in a row. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take North Carolina as well. I think regardless of the of the the result of between Miami and Georgia Tech, I think Miami was due for a loss. Uh, I think they're they're due for another one. I think North Carolina is legitimately good, better than I expected uh, the beginning of the season when I thought that uh, Mac Brown's time is maybe maybe be the beginning of the end for him. But uh, no, I like North Carolina to cover at home. Blair, how about you? Yeah, I'm going to go uh, the other way. I'm going to go ahead and take Miami to bounce back. Wow, um, I, I think they've been actually a little bit better um, this season. I think they were overlooking uh i think they were looking ahead to north carolina last week mm. and maybe so much that they weren't even paying attention to the clock there at the end of the game <laughs> yeah um I, but at north carolina is, is is they got a great quarterback in drake may i think their defense is playing better than i expected it to this year so this should be a good game uh, but as long as that locker room in miami is not uh, turning against its head coach i think they're the better team and will find a way to to bounce back this week For you Arizona football historians, and I think both of you know this, especially Blair, there are two Arizona games that come to mind that bring up uh, what Mario Cristobal did last week. One of them was in 2004 against Washington State, Mike Stoops' first year. Arizona needed to just take a knee. They ran the ball. They Gilbert Harris fumbled. Washington State threw a touchdown, and that was that. I remember uh, what I taped the broadcast, went back to my apartment, and heard the legendary Keith Jackson say that he never declared a game over uh, and then had it go the other way. Uh, which he did there. And then we we think back to 2014 Washington yep. where Chris Peterson should have taken a knee. He did not. Uh, it, his team fumbled. And then they could have gotten the down Cameron. to like five, five to 10 seconds, I think. So yeah. they couldn't, the they couldn't quite run around. it out. Yeah. But yeah, they, they could. it's what they should have done. And then, you know, you punt and the game's over. Yeah. So uh, it happened. I mean, the Arizona one and one in games that I can remember against the, uh, the Washington schools. But this was a tough one for Miami, who was undefeated at the time. That's for sure. Now, a team that two teams that are not undefeated but have one loss. Oregon State is hosting UCLA and is a four point favorite. Blair, I'll start with you on this one. Do the Beavers keep it going at home? They have been the best home team against the spread in college football since 2021. 
Yeah, and they've, they've, they're on a streak. Um, I think they've won 14 in their last 15 at home overall. Yep. So yep. they play very well up there. they got a great atmosphere now. That stadium's completely renovated. I think uh, DJ Uyunglele's had a good season and coming off a great game last week. UCLA's defense, though, has been really good this season. I just think with a young quarterback at UCLA, this is going to be a really tough game in Corvallis. The Magic might run out at some point this season at, at Reser, but I don't think it's this week. I will take Oregon State to just barely cover, maybe by six or seven uh, this week at home against UCLA. Good pick. How about you, Shane? Yeah, both of these teams visit Tucson uh, later this season, which should be both of those should be great games. But yeah, to Blair's point, UCLA is number one in the country in in uh, yards allowed per play, which is an amazing statistic. On a you think offense first with Chip Kelly. Uh, with that said, though, I think it, like you said, Eric, yeah, o- Oregon State is is great at home. That and I I think it's an this is one of the easier decisions for me on on this one. So uh, is uh, UCLA had a very impressive win against Washington State, but I think Oregon State it, home field advantage is big, especially in the in the Pac-12, especially in the Pacific Northwest. You get later in the year. I'm gonna gonna uh, gonna go with the Beavers. Think about two weeks ago, Oregon State was a three and a half point home favorite against Utah. Great, very good defense, similar to UCLA. Young quarterback and Oregon State blitzed him by two touchdowns. I think we see pretty much the same thing here. Uh, Dante Moore not ready for the Oregon State crowd at Reister Stadium. I think Oregon State covers. So we'll agree with that, excuse me, across the board. All right, let's go to the three big ones, and we'll do it kind of in reverse order here. USC, who Arizona played last week, we talked a lot about them, It's at Notre Dame, minus two and a half. I'm, I'm shocked that Notre Dame is a two and a half point favorite here, Shane. I, 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 I like USC here to pull the upset. I did not see much from Notre Dame in that loss uh, last week, uh, embarrassingly, to Louisville on the road. How about you? As much credit as Arizona deserves, Eric, for for hanging with USC in a game they probably should have won, especially at USC. I think we've learned from the, um, the Trojans' last three games, they're just not that good outside outside of Caleb Williams. They're a maybe slightly above average football team, and on defense, maybe below average. So I, I, think, I think the line's about right. I think Notre Dame bounces back. I think they win, and, and USC finally get – gets exposed in a way that, that, you know, Arizona ASU hung with USC for a while. Colorado made it interesting. Arizona probably should have beaten them in SC. I think Notre Dame finally gets the job done. I think they win and they cover. Blair, how about you? Yeah, I'm a little bit torn with this pick because my eyes sort of tell me what Shane was saying. I I'm a little bit disappointed in this USC team so far this year. Um, Offensively, they, they don't, something's not right there offensively um, this year. I mean, it's really the Caleb Williams show and there's not a lot of the run games. Okay. At times, but the, the, the passing game is just not the same as we've seen from, from USC in previous years and, and other Lincoln Riley offenses, the defense still, still gives up too many big plays. I think Notre Dame's a pretty good team. I would pick them kind of, I would feel like they would win this game, but they're playing their fourth week in a row of a really kind of tough game. And so, uh, you know, they had the Ohio state game that came down to the final play. Then they had the Duke game that came down to the end. They had the Louisville game that they lose last week, and now it's USC back there in South Bend. Um, this will be USC's really first game to get up for. But I'm going to find – I think the Irish find a way. I'm just not sold on this USC team. I just, something seems a little bit off other than Caleb Williams being the best player in the country at his position. So I was doing some research for my uh, Sportsline College Football Pick Show, which you can find on YouTube every Wednesday. Uh, we've Solid had, plug, you know, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and all of the trends, basically all of them, point to Notre Dame winning this game. But you know what? I, we we and we talked about it. I mean, Blair mentioned it. You mentioned Caleb Williams is the best player in the country, uh, and he just finds a way. I Notre Dame just looks tired to me. Maybe both Notre Dame and USC were looking ahead to this week and and kind of let last week go. But that the, uh, Notre Dame has not looked good for three weeks in a row. And let's be honest, before the fourth quarter against Colorado, USC looked darn good when they were up forty-one to fourteen. We would not have been questioning them at all. Uh, I'm going to go with USC to pull an upset here. I think USC wins this game by uh, three to four points somewhere in that ballpark. I, I, I just think their their luck will continue for another week. Probably will run out later in the year against like an Oregon on the road. But I, I just think USC is, is too strong here and, and I'm going to pick them here. All right. This one is an awesome matchup. Really looking forward to it. And so for the for the purposes of this one, we'll give a, a half point spread. We'll go with Washington minus two and a half against Oregon at home up in Seattle. I like the Huskies. I think Michael Penix Jr. is the leader for the Heisman Trophy right now. But I think this game will be lower scoring than people think. I mean, the, the over under 67 and a half, a lot of people will pick it to be 40 to 30 something. I think it's going to be a little bit lower scoring than that. But I like Washington. Blair, how about you? Yeah, this is going to be a great game. I hope it is at least. It, it's easily the best matchup in the pack in, in a number of years. I thought going in before the season, I kind of 
handicapped the Pac-12 coming down to the to the who would have the best defense and offense mix. I thought Utah with Cam Rising, assuming he'd be back after a couple weeks at the start of the season, they'd be good enough offensively and then have the best defense in the league. I thought they could get to the Pac-12 title game. And then I thought Washington would have the probably the best overall offense or maybe number two to USC. Washington's defense is improved this year. They're playing well. The passing game with Michael Penix is elite. But I have been surprised through the first six weeks of the season at Oregon. I think they might be the most balanced team in the league right now. They've got a little bit of a revenge factor for the way they gave the game away last year in yeah. this uh, matchup. So I will take the Ducks to pull the upset on the road. Interesting. Shane, how about you? Yeah, it's funny because I've, I've been big on Washington all year. There's this little nagging voice that's telling me that Oregon's going to win this game. I'm going to choose to ignore it because, I, again, I think home field advantage is a big deal, especially in, in Seattle, which is one of the best environments in college football. So for that reason, and I do think Washington is at least as well-rounded a team as Oregon is, maybe better. Uh, I'm going to take the Huskies to cover. I don't feel good about it, but I, I, it's more about me being stubborn and sticking with Washington than, than and going that direction as opposed to what my gut's telling me. This one's a tough one to pick. That's yeah. for sure. I, I just, I, I don't have a strong feeling on it, but I, you, you and I agree, Shane, going with Washington. All right. I'm going to go first on this last one. And it is Arizona at Washington State, and the Cougars are eight and a half point favorites. And I'm just going to say this. I told Shane as we were walking out of Arizona Stadium the other week against Washington, I said, you know, I could see him keeping it fairly close against USC. Uh, remember, you know, now that we see it, four straight games against the Trojans have been decided by one possession. But against the Cougars, uh, Arizona does not fare well. And I, I just did not have a good feeling about this game. And especially now with the letdown effect, I, I, I actually think Washington State to cover this eight and a half is a cinch. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you all can ridicule me on social media. But for now, I will go Washington State 38, Arizona 20. Blair, I'll come to you next. Give me your score prediction and some rationale on this game on Saturday. Yeah, this is going to be a tough game. Washington State's better than I thought they were going to be this year. I thought their defense would take a little bit more of a step back than it has, and the offense has improved more than I thought it was going to. Uh, Cam Ward has looked really good this season, uh, throwing the football, looks a lot more comfortable in the pocket. His offensive line uh, has protected a little bit better this year than they were doing last year. With all of that said, um, for me, this is a big game for Arizona's offensive line and defensive line. I went back a couple nights ago watched some of uh, the first half of our game with Washington State last year. And I almost had to laugh a little bit watching the way our defensive front played in that game against Washington State. It is night and day different how much better Arizona is uh, defensively in the front and the back end is playing better too, um, you know, this year. It, it was almost like I was watching a different team. And to that point, I want to give Johnny Nansen a lot of credit because a year ago I was incredibly skeptical of the hire of Johnny Nansen as the defensive coordinator. I was very critical of the effort through much of last season until things started to turn around towards the end of the year. They did a great job overhauling the roster. The scheme is much sounder this year. The players are performing. So I really look for Arizona's defensive front to play a factor. It needs to do a better job against the run. Washington State doesn't run the ball very well. It needs to make sure it doesn't run the ball. Last year, Washington State was able to run a little bit better than they did on average a year ago against Arizona. Cam Ward was part of that. Um, and then on the offensive side of the ball for Arizona, whether it's Noah Fafita, who I think would probably get the start this week. I think they'll hold Jaden Delora out one more week. Um, and get that bye week to come up. But Arizona needs to run the ball too, and it needs to protect the quarterback. And that comes down to Brennan Carroll's offensive line. It's been a lot of moving parts this season on that right side of the line, but I think Brennan Carroll's done a really good job with it. So as long as Arizona comes to play physical, the way it did last week at USC, running the football, protecting the quarterback, blocking on the perimeter, and then defensively controlling that line of scrimmage and uh, tackling well in the secondary – I think Arizona is going to go on the road. I think they're going to get that big win that's escaped them the last mm. couple of weeks. I'll take Arizona 31-27. Wow. I absolutely love it. Shane, are you going to pick Arizona to upset Washington State as Blair just did? Absolutely not. No, I, I look, I, I was wrong about the game last week. I thought USC was going to come in uh, angry and blow out Arizona, and that didn't happen. Um I'm going to kind of double down this week, though, because I think it's going to happen uh, against Washington State. I think Washington State's a team that got embarrassed offensively at UCLA and is going to come back home and and let out a lot of frustration on Arizona. Arizona's defense has improved, much improved, but Cam Ward is still very good. Arizona still doesn't have an interception this season somehow, mm -hmm. some way. If that changes against Washington State, then maybe things, things go better. As far as the quarterback... I don't want Jaden Delore to start this game, not only because I think Noah Fafita is the better quarterback, but because Jaden's a very emotional guy. And going back into Pullman, I think it's just, it, 
I don't think he he harnesses his emotions as well as I would like. So I think Noah Fafita gives Arizona a better chance to win for that reason. And I just think he's been playing better. So I hope it's going to be Noah. And I actually agree with you, Blair. I think they're probably going to wait until after the, uh, the bye to bring Jade back. I think every game after the bye is winnable for Arizona, but I don't think this one is. I'm going to go Washington State 41, Arizona 24. Wow. All right. Well, you and I kind of similar, but I hope Blair's right. And with that said, though, I am 6-0 against the spread picking Arizona games this year. Yeah. I would I would like to be wrong. I would like to go to 6-1. and one. I just don't see it. Arizona has not played well up in the Palouse in a long time. I, I, Blair, do you remember offhand the last time that Arizona has won up in Washington State? Oh, boy. We would have... Um... We did it early in the in, in Coach Rodriguez's tenure. We won pretty big up there. It's in like a, a 58 37 kind of game or something like that. I remember, yeah, I don't remember the year. Touchdown and, yeah. and um, yeah, very good, Shane. That was 2017. You're right. That was 58 37. Okay. Good call. That was the only time Arizona has beaten Washington State since 2014 when it was 59 37. So if Arizona's going to win, they probably have to score. I think that game was in Tucson, though. I want to say that uh, game. I want to say I was at that oh, game with, with the Cool Tate. Cool Tate yeah, yeah, you're right. That one was in Tucson, and I remember that. That was homecoming. You're right. So in 2014, it was 59-37 okay. in Pullman. Good call, Blair. I was close. Good yeah. But Arizona has not fared very well. Um, I guess they they fared fairly well, just not not recently. They have lost five of their last six here and six of eight. So um, let's hope they can turn it around, but not as optimistic this week. But hey, it's been good discussion. Really enjoyed it, Blair. Thanks so much for joining Shane and I for the whole show. It's been an absolute blast. So for Blair Willis and Shane Dale, I am Eric Cohen. Thanks for listening. And as always, bear down. Bear down.